and welcome to A Considered Craft. My name is Jess, and this is a podcast about the choices we make as we make. It is the 12th of March, 2022, and uh, while I'm normally based in New York, I am currently recording this in a northern San Diego neighborhood on unceded Kumeyaay lands. I have uh, really one main thing I was hoping to share today, and it's all about this finished object that I'm wearing. So I'm going to tell you all about this cardigan, including um, some kind of bigger mistakes that I made and how I went about fixing them. I'm also going to talk a bit about the yarn that I used, and if you um, haven't watched my podcast before, I like to dive just a little bit deeper into um, the animals that share their fleece with us and see what we can learn together about understanding something about the, um, in this case, the sheep that, uh, that were used in this beautiful project. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about, um, I feel like there have been so many learnings for me since the last recording, and I would love to share some wonderful things I've learned about that people in this making community are doing that I think other people might be interested to know about. So why don't we dive right in? Uh, this is, what I'm wearing is the Elstfjord cardigan by Ellie of Skandier Knits. And, um, I will talk a lot more about the yarn, but let me just briefly let you know what it is, which is um, Daughter of a Shepherd, Heritage DK. So I'm going to go much more into this, but let's first talk about the garment itself, its construction, where I kind of mm, uh, messed up and what I did about it. So I was really attracted to this garment. It is a really deep v-neck cardigan, and that did not exist in my wardrobe, actually. I looked at what I had, and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. I don't have this shape of garment. So I was excited to make something that was kind of a new addition and a really, really wearable garment. I feel like this is something that has a construction and a shape, and for my yarn choice, that feels really... Um, modern. It's got these big balloon sleeves on it, but otherwise is a very classic design and feels to me like something I could wear in more of a work setting and also, um, you know, out with friends to have dinner and with jeans and around the house. And so it seems really, really practical and versatile. It is, um, you know, pretty traditional in that it has this deep v-neck. So I'll stand up for a second so you can see. Uh, let me move this. My chair in this location, we just moved apartments. And these chairs are super heavy, so um, move that guy out of the way so you can sort of see this. I'll stand back. So you can see it comes down like this, and then there are um, five larger buttons than, than I've used before. I'll give you a close-up of the button. So uh, it hits me about mid-hip, is a really classic shape, and then has the fun twist of these large uh, balloon sleeves. I'm going to insert a couple of pictures, too, so that you can see some other way uh, that I've worn this. But while I'm standing up, let me just point out, it wasn't called for in the pattern, but I added some waist shaping. So uh, she gives two different lengths in the pattern, and um, sorry, two different options, one where you can decrease for the waist and one where you just go straight down, but it's called for ending a little bit shorter. And because I knew I wanted to make this um, a bit longer, I decided to add some kind of gentle waist shaping in, but particularly with the large balloon sleeves, I thought that would be a nice um, shaping balance for somebody with my figure anyway. And the construction of this garment was really interesting. It was something that I hadn't done before. So it was knit um, completely in the round and there was a steek not only for the, um, for the uh, this whole deep V, so, 
when it's it's almost hard to imagine and I wished I had taken a picture when it was at this stage. I have some pictures I'll insert so you can get kind of an idea. This is my Oust Fjord in process and I thought I would point out a couple of the decision points and why I've stopped where I've stopped um, until I can try some things on. So this is a um, kind of v-neck, deep v-neck cardigan where you cut open um, the steak stitches for the center middle and for the armholes. So I really like to do my sleeves before I do the whole body. So what I did was um, I cut open the steaks for the sleeves on both sides. And um, so I cut them open and you can see more easily on this side. After you cut it open, uh, I was then able to seam the shoulder together. And then on this side, once I had done that, I was able to actually pick, pick up and knit the sleeve. This is the first time I've done a balloon sleeve like this before. So I left the stitches and actually the ball of yarn is stuffed inside that sleeve on a holder. So I've started the cuff and I just put that on hold until it gets to the point where I can try it on. So I've knit down to what would usually be the length that I would want a cardigan like this to be. And so you can see here I bound off the center steak stitches, I've reinforced either side of it, and I've started on the ribbing at the bottom. But I've also uh, left these live stitches. I'm gonna put this on a holder. And I'd really like to try this on to make sure that this style of sleeve with a little bit of a drop shoulder and a big balloon sleeve, that I like the length of a typical cardigan for me with that kind of construction. So after reinforcing this center steak, what I'm going to do, that's all done. What I'm gonna do is actually just cut open enough of this to uh, put my head through the opening. So I'm gonna try this on and then I'll make some final decisions about the size of the sleeve and the length. I will then go back and do the second sleeve. And before I finish cutting the entire center open, I'll actually pick up and knit the um, button band and uh, this has the neck stitches. You pick up and knit the, net, knit the neck stitches as well. So that's what's yet to come. This has been knit in um, Daughter of a Shepherd Heritage DK, which has been just a dream to work with. So uh, you you have an opening for the collar uh, like this. This rib band isn't here. And then you have a steak that comes all the way down. And what you're doing is on either side of the steak, as you come down, you're increasing. And that's what ends up making this V shape so that when you cut it open, you've started with something, you know, uh, smaller, and then you, you increase on both sides that become the increases uh, that create this nice, nice deep V shape. And then of course, when you get to where that top button was, you're just knitting straight from there. The new part for me, so that was sort of new, like I hadn't done those increases before. I've done something where you just knit in the round and maybe you have some um, shaping at the sides, but the shaping in the middle around the steak was new to me. And this also had steaks for the armholes. So um, where you can see the shoulders are, this actually got, once you cut, once you cut the armhole open, you end up um, seaming these, so you you cut down here and you end up seaming these two shoulder pieces together and you're left with a big opening which is where you pick up and knit straight down not a single decrease in these sleeves until you get to the cuff so it is just stockinette gliding joy and I'll say something about this here too which is um I think a lot of us struggle with this whole being on sleeve island thing and um, I just was listening to a podcast where somebody said they were thinking about some bigger sleeves. Um, I think it was on one of the patterns from the um, Shetland Trader 3, the Goodwin Johnston, beautiful stranded design um, book that, that came out uh, I think last October or so. And anyway, there are some balloon sleeves in there and the person was kind of commenting about how they knew those sleeves were just going to take forever. 
I had a really different experience. This was my first time doing balloon sleeves. And because the circumference of these sleeves is bigger than, um, than I've ever made sleeves before, I was able to use a 16 inch circular. And because I didn't have to pay attention to where I was putting decreases in, this was just like knitting a tube that went super, super fast. And there's a slight drop shoulder in this design as well. So all that to say, if, if um, thinking about being on Sleeve Island forever is something that has kept you from trying this um, trend with the, with the bigger sleeves, I would encourage you to think about if it might also work for you to go really fast if you're on a larger circumference and there are fewer, if any, decreases until you get to the cuff. Um, so that's the design. It's a pretty classic. I chose this deep, deep chocolate brown, um, and <clears throat> so it's very wearable with a lot of different things. But I also had some, oh, I, I should say that at the end, you, you, um, you know, you, uh, you knit all the way to the bottom, you do your ribbing, and then you pick up and knit the button band, which starts at one bottom edge, comes all the way up, you go around the back of the neck and come down, and then you do ribbing and put in your buttonholes. I used the trick from, um, I talked about this in my last episode, Elizabeth Zimmerman, who I've knit her baby surprise jacket quite a bit, she has this technique where she has you um, put buttonholes on both sides of the garment, and if you are careful about your spacing, you then know that your buttons and buttonholes are going to line up with each other really precisely. and. Um, I find it to be a really good um, trick. It would have been okay to not do it on this because of the ribbing. I think it's easier to match up the button and the buttonhole after with the ribbing, but um, it's just a trick I've found that has made it a lot easier for me to make sure things really uh, line up. So you put the buttonholes, you place the buttonholes on both sides, and if you've done the stitch counts properly, your holes are in exactly the same place, and then you just sew the button over the hole on the side where you don't need it. So maybe that will be a tip that will work for some other people as well. I ran into um, a couple of problems that were nothing to do with the pattern. The pattern is well written. Um, oh, I should say a little bit about, I've done some test knits for Skein Deer before, and um, her work seems to often be associated with some color work. I think she got popular on the knitting scene for introducing um, sometimes a little modern twist, but her twists on some traditional Scandinavian design items. But she's also designed a lot of like sort of vintage inspired and modern garments that are not color work at all. And she pays a lot of attention to um, grading her projects in such a way that I find as somebody, you know, um, larger busted, very curvy, she gives you lots of information that helps you really um, fit things. And she's been thoughtful, like the shoulders are usually, there's very little difference in, um, in the sizing for her for the shoulders, because regardless of the size of your bust, you, you don't always need that much more width in the shoulders. And so she's just very thoughtful about all of her grading and all of her um, care that goes into sizing her garments. I also think she strikes a really nice balance of giving you all the information that you need while still keeping her patterns kind of crisp and clean and short-ish. I would say I think with some photos in the pattern this whole garment pattern was maybe three pages four pages. So it's all there. All the information that you need is there. It's just written in a very concise way. She also links you to techniques and tutorials on some of the things if that might be helpful as well. So um, so I really like her patterns and um, I did not test knit this one just to be clear. This was a pattern that I bought and um, I think the day it came out because I really uh, it really spoke to me. So where did I mess up? I messed up on the steek. And I think steeking is something that can be a little bit scary to people. And the message of this story is that even with cutting, things are salvageable if you have a little goof. So I'll tell you my goof, and it was totally my goof. Um, 
I've steaked quite a bit before, but I have always used my sewing machine to sew reinforcement up either side of where I was going to cut. Even though I'm generally using rustic woolen spun, stickier wools, I have felt more comfortable adding that kind of reinforcement before I do the cut. And um, I didn't think about it before I started this project that I don't have my sewing machine with me because I'm on the road at the moment. So I got to the point where um, I actually got to just under the sleeves and I had this realization that um, I usually try on my garments. I love to do top down because I can try them on as I go. And I got to this realization when I uh, got just past the sleeves that this is generally a place where I would stop and try things on. And I couldn't try them on because the the there's no sleeve opening. And I was like, oh, maybe I should go ahead and cut those open. And, you know, um, I also like to do the sleeves before I finish the whole body. So I was like, oh, I, it's time to do the reinforcement and cut open the steak. And then I realized I didn't have my sewing machine with me. And I'm not much of a hand sewer. I knew that was an option. But I also know a lot of people use a crochet steaking technique. And I had tried that once before, um, but found it a little bit more fiddly. And I, I find it easier to use the sewing machine. And so I've just always reverted to that. But I knew that crochet reinforcement was a possibility. Then I realized that um, usually I make the center stitch of my steek, the, the bridge of stitches, I usually make the center stitch a purl. And so that way when I go to um, reinforce it, I flip the garment inside out and I now have on the wrong side of the garment, I have a knit stitch running down the middle surrounded by purl stitches. And that makes it really easy when you have a sewing machine to go along either side of that center stitch and you know run your reinforcement. And then it makes it really easy to cut right up the middle of the knit stitch on the wrong side of the garment. However, that is not the ideal thing to do if you're going to be doing a crochet reinforcement method because generally the crochet reinforcement instructions that I've seen anyway usually have you taking, they're usually done with a fully knit bridge, so you're knitting all the stitches across. Maybe you purl right at the edges um, of the steak bridge so that it helps the fabric turn under once you've cut the steak open, but the main part of the steak is all um, stuck in it. And how I've seen it is primarily to do the reinforcement with crochet on the right side of the garment where you're taking a leg from the center stitch that you're going to be ultimately cutting open and a leg from the neighboring stitch and that's where you do your crochet reinforcement. Because I had a purl um, surrounded by knit stitches, I didn't have that cleanness of how to pick up the and do the crochet. So I watched a whole bunch of tutorials and then I found one that showed um, a method where you, uh, you do a slip stitch instead of a single crochet and you do it between two rows of stockinette. So I, was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So that's what I did. I slip stitched all the way up. When I started to cut open, and actually it was on the sleeve because that's what I cut open. When I started to cut open, my stitches started to come a little bit unraveled. And in fact, the whole crochet chain started to slide off where I had just cut open. And um, I had a moment of slight panic and then I remembered very little is going to happen. This is sticky material. The stitches are not just going to all come out all at once. The edges were coming out and starting, you know, to unravel, but little else had happened. So once I took a deep breath and um, I think I put it away for a day because I was a little bit panicked and annoyed with myself about the mistake, I went back and rewatched the video again like three times and I realized that they give the instruction that I missed of going over one more column before you put the crochet reinforcement. So the good news about that is I could still do that. So I just went back in and carefully as to not 
pull and tug on the fabric too much. I just added another crochet reinforcement over one column of stitches, removed the crochet reinforcement that I had put in the wrong place, and all is good. It's a little bit of a thicker, I'll, I'll put in a, um, a photo uh, um, so that you can see this. It means there's a little bit more in the cut portion than there normally would be. It's a little bit thicker right there at the seams, but this is DK weight fabric in a kind of looser fitting drapey item. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't even do anything to tack down the cut stitches after. I don't do the ribbon over it or anything like that. I just leave it and then the the fabric kind of felts on itself as you've worn it and as you've washed it. So for me, it's fine. I think if I had done, you know, a fingering weight um, or maybe even sport weight more fitted item, this might not have worked so well. It might, it, you know, the bulkiness of it might be more bothersome in a more fitted garment like that. But for me, in this weight of fabric and in this garment, I wasn't worried about it at all. It worked just fine. And then when I did the um, the crochet reinforcement up the middle, because I learned this lesson from the arm uh, steak, and then I was able to just do things the proper way when I went up the um, center stitch and did the, the big long steak in the middle. So that was my big oops and how I fixed it. And yeah, it's a super wearable garment that I want to tell you a little bit about this wonderful yarn that it's in. Um, I am curious though, actually, before I go forward, if you guys have steeked before, is this something that you have thought about doing, have wanted to do? Are you worried about steeking? Does it just not interest you? Um, if you feel like leaving a comment below, I would love to know what you love about steeking, what your reinforcement techniques are, or if you haven't steeked yet but are interested in it, what what do you think would help you make it happen or what's kept you from doing it so far? Take a sip of coffee. It's early here. <laughs> okay. So I already showed you the label for this really special yarn. This is Daughter of a Shepherd Heritage. It's a DK weight yarn. It's 233 meters, which is um, 255 yards in 100 grams. It's a three-ply worsted spun undyed. It's um, sourced, scoured, and milled in the UK. Something that's really fun about this, so the, the reason um, that this is called Daughter of a Shepherd is the, the woman behind it, whose name I believe is Rachel, her father is the shepherd on an estate near York. And um, so she uses this uh, Hebridean fleece in a lot of the yarns that she produces, and it comes from the sheep that her father is the shepherd on that estate. And one of the fun things is that it actually tells you on the label, tells you on the label the year of the clip. So this was from, even the date, this is from uh, July 19th, 2017 clip. So it is 75% uh, Hebridean and 25% Zorbles. And the Zorbles is from Exmoor. And these were frankly two sheep breeds that I knew nothing about. And I can't even remember if I had seen them before. I'd heard of Hebridean because of you know, their geographic location, but I didn't know anything about the sheep. And the way I even found this yarn is actually um, Jill Draper, uh, whose business is called um, Jill Draper Makes Stuff. And um, she, I will be talking much more about her yarns. I've knit a lot a lot, a lot with her yarn, and I'm kind of surprised I haven't shown anything yet, but um, she had a supply of this on hand and put it up for sale. So that's how I learned about it, and I also uh, kind of knew that if it was something that Jill had bought and Jill was sharing, that it was highly likely to be something I would be super happy with. So I bought two different kinds of yarn from her in that sale, both Daughter of a Shepherd, and the other one I used to um, make, it's a, it's a really high twist to the other one and kind of a natural camel color, 
and I used it to make a really long Hohilo Catelli cabled cardigan that I will talk about at some point because it's a staple item in my wardrobe. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that sometime. But these are the only two yarns I've ever used from Daughter of a Shepherd. And so the, the Hebridean sheep, as I mentioned, comes from this, uh, apologies if I don't get the pronunciation right, it's um, I think S. Crick Park Estate, which is near York, and it's her father, John Atkinson, who is the shepherd. And her focus, the daughter of a shepherd, is, is all about using British wool and keeping everything as local as possible um, to producers within the United Kingdom. And this is... Um, you know, it's really soft when you touch it, It's which is super interesting because when I read about the Hebridean sheep and also those warbles, they are not necessarily, at least in everything I read, known for the softness. So uh, they're known to be a bit hardier with a good crimp in the fabric from what I'm reading. And um, so I assume it has something to do with the way they were blended and spun and produced because it is... It, it's a very silky sort of feel. There are some prickly bits. I've said before that I'm a more sensitive person to, um, to these materials and particularly at my neck, I will pretty instantly have um, a reaction and find them very uncomfortable if they're on the, you know, uh, scratchier side. I would not describe this as scratchy. I would describe this as soft that has some occasional hairs <laughs> that are sticking out that do get a little bit, I notice them a little bit if it gets right up on my neck. So I've been wearing this with a shirt underneath. And in fact, the shirt I'm wearing, because even though it's morning, it's quite warm here. I'm wearing a sleeveless shirt right now. And I'm perfectly comfortable with this on my arm. So the, the prickle that is there is not one that is bothersome for me on my arms, but I would probably not make anything that really came up onto my neck. And this was another good matching of yarn and pattern because this is this deep V-neck. So you can also see the overall color here. I'm gonna hold up this um, yarn close to the camera. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's like this complex blackish brown, and there are some light, like silvery bits in it, which I was reading, you know, as the sheep age, they're kind of well known for how dark and how black they look. And I'm going to pop some photos in, but as they age, like all of us, <laughs> I suppose, we, uh, we start to get some grays. And so that adds almost like this lightness and I don't want to say shimmeriness. It's not like it's shiny or glittery or anything in that shininess um, end of things. But it adds this nice brightness throughout that I really enjoy. Um, and... Jill noted in her write-up that this yarn is really known for, you know, it's it's clearly been scoured and cleaned, and there were very few bits of any hay or, or debris of any kind, which sometimes you find in more natural yarns. I didn't find that at all, but it does smell like, like sheep in such a very, very, very good way. So I'm going to put up some... Um, photos and in the down bar below I'm going to link I don't I actually know the permissions required when somebody posts something on Facebook I don't know if you can repost that so I'm just going to link to it below but there's actually some images from the farm where the sheep came from and a video of the sheep so I'll put the link to those below and the pictures that I put in and the pictures that I always use come from um are are from wiki commons and so uh they're, they're more, I'm more confident in, in the permissions with sharing those. And um, yeah, they get increasingly coarse fleece, I guess, as they age as well. So it could be that some of this softness also comes maybe from the age, uh, maybe perhaps these were um, shorn as younger sheep. It doesn't say lamb's wool or anything like that. So I'm just speculating on that. So that is the Hebridean sheep. 
75% of this heritage decay is Hebridean, and the other 25% is Zwarbles, which I'm going to put a picture up because the most fun thing about looking up these sheep were how crazy cute these Zwarbel sheeps are. They are from Holland and um, now are all over um, the world, actually. And um, the word Zwarbels, I guess Zwart is black and Bless is blaze. And so, right, they have this incredible blaze down there, down their face. And it says the wool comes from, um, in, in basically from dark brown to black. And the fleeces are often prepared together. And so you end up with this dark blackish brown. It's, uh, again, a little bit more on the rustic side. And um, I look up some, I look up some of this fiber information on, um, you know, not only like, um, livestock uh, websites, but also on um, spinning and more fleece oriented websites. And mostly they talk about how this is often a wool that's chosen because of its sturdiness, the Zorbals, for things like outerwear and blankets and um, projects that require a sturdy wool and that it felts really well. So if you're looking for that kind of property for something that you're interested in making, might be interesting to check out if you can get your hands on some Zwerbels. I think that's everything about the yarn and about this particular um, garment. And normally I also talk about the sock experiment, which um, if you haven't heard me talk about that before, I'll try to give the short version, but this is basically a very long-term experiment that, um, that I'm doing where I am looking at what properties actually contribute to longevity in handmade socks over time. So I think a lot of people have a lot of different theories about this and a lot of different um, experiences through their own wearing of socks and I talk to people about this in yarn stores all the time and some people feel very strongly you know without nylon your socks are just going to fall apart some people feel like nylon isn't necessary you do need some sort of strengthener but it could be something else like mohair silk linen um, hemp you know things like that and there are other people who say it actually has a lot more to do with the breed of sheep the um, you know the number of plies, the how high the twist is, and how tight your gauge is. So there's a lot of different variables, and I was really interested. For me, this may not be true for anyone else, and it may not be of interest to everybody. But for me, I was really interested if I was going to put the time and energy, and you know the fleece from these sheep into a sock, I want to know how I can make that sock last. And if I need nylon, okay, that's really good to know. Now I can look for things that have nylon in it. But if I don't, I would rather make a different choice and have a material that will um, biodegrade over time. So those are the kind of things I'm interested in answering for questions for myself is what actually makes the difference. So I'm knitting socks that are only worn as part of this experiment. I didn't include socks that I had made or worn before. And I'm keeping some things consistent, like the wash method, whether or not the yarn has been prepared with a super wash material or not. I do a gentle hand wash of all of them and I keep the gauge on the tighter side. But other than that, I'm varying as many of those other factors as I can kind of get my hands on. So the number of plies, the types of sheep's fleece that are included in the um, yarn, the, uh, the twist, the um, materials that are in it, whether or not it has nylon or some of those other strengtheners. So, all kinds of variables. I'm trying to maximize how many of those different things I measure, but keep the gauge pretty tight. And just as an example, in a fingering weight, I'm aiming for somewhere around 37 or 38 stitches over 10 centimeters or four inches for light fingering, 
39 to 40 over 10 centimeters or four inches. And I'm also including some sport weight socks where I'm getting more like 35, 36 ish um, over 10 centimeters or four inches. So I'm keeping a pretty tight gauge. And what I'm doing is I'm tracking every time I wear them, what I'm wearing them, you know, how long, what I'm wearing them for, am I exercising or am I hanging around the house or something in between, what shoes, if any, am I wearing them with, and then when I take them off, I give a look over, um, for the wear and I keep track of um, how many times I've washed them. And so my interest is that over time that I can start to see patterns in what creates um, wear. So that's the hope. And in many of my other episodes, I've gone over one or more pairs of socks and talked about them in, the, in this sock experiment section. But today, I found so many good learning tips about extending the life of socks from other people out there, and I thought I would just mention a few of them. I've mentioned some before. In fact, um, I pointed in two episodes ago to some mending and conversation on Hey Brownberry um, Mars's channel and on um, Emma from the Woolly Mammoth, she gives some tips as well on extending the life. So I've talked about those two um, before. I think those are the only two longevity things I've specifically talked about. And today I want to talk about um, a couple of people and um, some mending techniques. So the first one I want to reference is from um, Patty Joy White, who goes by the Instagram handle Socks Therapist. And you might know Patty Joy, but not know you know Patty Joy because she is the designer of the Fish Lips Kiss heel, which is a really wonderful um, short roll heel, heel construction. So she does a lot of socks, has a lot of expertise in designing socks, and also has tips around um, mending your socks. And so two things I want to point out that have been, um, uh, that, that really come from, from her. One of them, and I'll link these down below, one of them is an interesting idea she had that's um, kind of a humanitarian aid challenge at the same time that we get some mending done and extend the life of our handmade goods. And so her idea was if we looked around at our socks, but I think this could apply to other things as well, something that maybe we weren't going to mend, we were just going to replace. Her challenge was to consider mending that item and take the money that you would have spent on a new one and give it to a humanitarian aid cause. Um, she called out some agencies working to help um, Ukrainian refugees. Um, I will also add for those of us here in the States where many of us are, are kind of watching in horror about legislation that's passing, particularly in Texas and Florida, but in other locations as well around all kinds of civil rights issues and women's rights issues. And if you're interested in knowing more about that, um, there is a lot of information uh, on the internet that you can learn about um, the don't say gay bills, the, you know, the anti-woke bills in Florida that are restricting teachers teaching about black history, if it makes them uncomfortable, and a whole host of just civil rights that are under attack. So if you take Patty Joy's challenge, I would encourage you to find uh, somewhere to donate that money that speaks to your heart. And there are many worthy causes, um, as always. So um, that was one idea. And then she also, I had a lovely um, text exchange with her a bit where she talked about a technique that she uses where she takes a patch of cotton fabric and uses that to darn her socks, um, commercial socks as well as hand knit socks. So she uses, I'm just looking at my notes for my communication with her, she finds the cotton sashiko thread I'm not a sewer, so maybe, maybe sewers know that thread better. So the patches um, get sewn on, and she has experienced that that actually increases the longevity of how long her mend is going to last, and it also, um, I think, would look really 
cool. So she says first she secures it around the edges with a blanket stitch and then she quilts rows of running stitch through the patch and the sock. So I'll link to her Instagram down below and she just is like a wealth of information. She puts a lot of information in stories also. So if you're somebody who's looked at Instagram before but you've looked mostly at people's feed um, uh, the Instagram algorithm is really pushing people to do stories and reels and put in more video content. So um, a lot of people are putting a lot of their really useful and interesting content in these stories that, um, you know, that if you click on their profile, if you see a circle going around their profile, uh, you know they have a story or it's the circles that appear across the top of your screen. You can go through those and it's it's a plethora of information that's out there. Um, so she's one person I wanted to point to. The other person I wanted to point to is named Erin and um, her handle is Ren Bird Mens, and she has a real focus on mending, just published a book on mending in clothing um, and, and all sorts of techniques that she knows, but also around socks. And I'm going to link to her post below where she did this nine-month experiment where she patched a pair of commercial wool socks she had, and she did cotton thread on one foot and wool thread on the other foot, and then altered which, which foot she wore which mended sock on over nine months. And the cotton mending held up much better than the wool. So that's also super interesting to keep in mind. And there there's more to come on this. I have another a person I follow who does a lot of mending techniques on socks, and so I'm going to talk about them in an upcoming episode as well. But there's a lot of information out there about mending, so we can extend our socks however long they last us. And there are uh, three other things that were learnings that I had this week that I wanted to point to that are not specifically about socks. One of them is... Um, Making Stories, who has a podcast, they publish a magazine, their photos are available, their patterns are available, they have a digital pattern library, and they also um, source and stock all kinds of interesting yarns and products. They have a real focus on sustainability and making, and they're based in Berlin. And one of the people who's really involved, I think, is based in Canada, and she just did a short podcast episode about Gage. And gauge is one of those things, I know when I've talked to some friends about it, I've actually gotten eye rolls before. <laughs> there's like, sometimes there's little interest in talking about gauge. And what I really appreciated about this episode is that um, the woman who does the video, her name is Claire, she did it in kind of a different way than I've seen most videos about gauge. Most videos about gauge, which are also very helpful, tend to be on the more technical side. You're looking at someone's gauge swatch, they're showing you how to measure, it's, a, it's kind of an overlay where you're looking down at kind of technical pieces of, of knitting and counting and things like that. Also extraordinarily helpful. What I particularly liked about this video that Claire did and why I want to link it below is because Claire is basically sitting on her couch with her dog just chatting to you about Gage and why it matters and some simple things to think about. And for me, it felt like, oh, this is just a friend chatting to me about why thinking about Gage is important. And it, it just felt really comfortable and easy and not so, um, it wasn't like a math lesson, which, I think we also need the math lessons because gauge, gauge is really important. But if you're somebody who has kind of shied away from thinking too much about gauge and maybe you're one of those super lucky people that mostly you get the right size garment when you knit with the yarn that the pattern designer has called for, um, but maybe if you want to branch out and use different yarns than what a pattern is called for and you want to give yourself a little insurance policy by thinking a little bit about gauge, I would really point you to this video. 
The other two things I want to mention were tips that people gave me individually and I thought I would pass them on. One of them is my friend Elizabeth who uh, was doing the, uh, she comes to the social knitting group in San Diego. I had just done an episode about um, travel, travel knitting and um, kind of what to bring with you. For me, it was a little bit more about a road trip, but thinking about what needs to come with you and lessons I've learned as somebody on the road for five months. Um, Elizabeth just took a long plane ride and is getting ready to take another plane ride. And she's not a sock knitter. She, so she was like, oh, I want to think about this. And she said to me afterwards, after her first trip, she said, you know what worked out really well was to start a sweater on her flight because um, she knew it would give her a project that she could do while she was in her destination. And she, so she would have one like project with her. And when she started the project, it's really small and easy and manageable to work with. So I thought that was a really great tip and wanted to pass it along for anyone else who might have a plane or train or bus or shorter car ride coming up. Think about um, if you might want to start. I think this was a single yarn or maybe she does a lot of holding mohair together. So she might still have had two balls of yarn to deal with. Um, so maybe that will be of interest to someone else. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that... Um, Somebody named Mindy wrote to me and said, I'd been talking about some travel I have coming up and was asking if people knew about yarn stores along the route. And Mindy wrote to me and said, do you know there's a feature in Ravelry where if you go under the yarns section and scroll down a little bit, if Ravelry is accessible to you, you can actually put in where you're going from and where you're going to and how far off of a main route you would be willing to go for a yarn store. And it gives you the resulting list of yarn stores, at least that are active in Ravelry, including the number of, um, I think it's the number of purchases that have been made. So you know when you enter, if you're someone who enters your yarn on Ravelry and it asks you where you bought your yarn, I think this must be where they're pulling the information from. But it really gave me a pretty good idea about what was likely to be, be a um, larger yarn store or a more popular yarn store. I could easily scroll through and see um, the number of um, projects or purchases. I forget which one it is. So thank you, Mindy, for that tip. If anybody else has other tips on traveling and knitting I think many of us, myself included, are super excited about getting back to travel um, cautiously. We have we we went across the country, but we are pretty COVID cautious people. Um, I work mostly in healthcare, and um, so have definitely erred on the side of caution with everything that's been unfolding throughout the pandemic. And so like we have not eaten in restaurants. We, we, we don't go inside anywhere really that we can't wear our mask or that we have to be in for any extended period of time. So while we've been traveling, it's been a very adjusted version of traveling and getting across the country. And um, I'm really excited to think about getting back to some form of travel that was more similar to the before times and being on an airplane and going to foreign countries and traveling is one of my most favorite things in the world. And I've had an incredible opportunity to travel a lot, um, both for work and personally. And I think it's so important to learn about other cultures and spend time with different people and experience and see different things around the world. and eat different food and, you know, all of those things. And so I'm really looking forward to getting back to travel. And maybe you are too. Maybe you're already feeling more comfortable and you're back at travel and you have some good travel tips. Please pop them down below. Uh, I have very little in the life update front. We are, uh, today I'm recording this, it is our last day in California. We have been in a new location in California for 10 days nine days that's right on the beach and it's been wonderful. I really wanted to record this with the beach in the background but the lighting didn't work out so well so I'll probably insert some photos and if you don't know at the end of the videos I always put a whole bunch of photos and videos from what I've been doing and you can listen to 
the beautiful music by Ella Ray Condrat and watch some pictures, which often end up being of nature because that's what we spend a lot of our time out in nature. So if that interests you, the next time I make one of these, I hope I will also have some beautiful photos and um, videos from the national parks in Utah, which is where we are headed tomorrow. And um, I noticed in some other podcasters' videos, they talk about things that they're reading or watching or doing. And I also know that there are people watching this podcast from overseas. And there is an American show that I don't know if you have access to, but I thought I would call it out because I think it's just one of the most well done dramas that I've seen in a really long time and we're on the last season and it's called This Is Us. So whether, no matter where you live, if you have not seen This Is Us already, I, at the end of the season, I'm going to go back and watch the whole thing from beginning to end again. They've just, in, the acting is wonderful, the chemistry among the actors is wonderful, the storylines are impactful and I think so relatable for many of us and so I and it's just so well done I don't think I've been through an episode yet without crying so if that's not your jam then you won't like this is us but if you like a real emotional uh, drama um, it's a great one and perhaps like many of you I was thrilled to watch um, Outlander and to see that Outlander is back and um, I will say for me episode one of this season was a little a little slow going but I think they're setting a lot of things up for what's going to happen and I will not give any spoilers I will never talk about the content of stuff um, like that on here but it is joyful to have Outlander to look forward to and to enjoy as well. Um, and I hope if you enjoy Outlander, you're having fun with it too. <laughs> My friends and I have been texting with each other because we're seeing all these like magazines that are out there and it's so in the popular media um, what's happening with Outlander. So yeah, that is it from here. I hope that everyone is doing as well as possible and that you have some really fun knitting or making ahead. If you are up for it, please leave a comment below. I'd love to know what are you working on, of the travel questions that we were talking about before. And even if you just want to say hi and let me know where you're watching from, that would be really fun to know as well. So I am going to say goodbye from the U.S. and the West Coast and hug your loved ones and I'll see you soon. Bye.
Yes, I'll 